I have felt for some time a great desire that a tribute should be paid throughout Great Britain and in Ulster to the faithful, unwearying, and absolutely indispensable work done by the Home Guard month after month and year after year. Accordingly, next Sunday, military parades and religious services will be held throughout the land to associate the nation and the Home Guard in the celebration of its first three years of life. As we move through these tremendous times, with our swift succession of formidable or glittering events, we must not overlook or consider as matters of mere routine those unceasing daily and nightly efforts of millions of men and women which constitute the foundation of our capacity to wage this righteous war wherever it may carry us all over the world. All British war energies depend upon the unfailing defense and adequate nourishment of our small island home, which lies only 21 miles from the German batteries and only a few minutes flight from their airfields. <clears throat> Great Britain is the advanced fighting base of the United Nations and is still under constant siege and assault by air and sea. It is in a very large measure <clears throat> the powerhouse and directing center of the whole of the British Commonwealth and Empire. It is the source of a vast output of war equipment. It is the home and cradle of the Navy. From its ports sail the convoys which carry forth the expeditionary armies and to them come the food and supplies by which our tense, organized, vibrant life is sustained. In this home there burns the light of freedom. Guard it well, home guard. Our eyes are fixed upon the future, but we may spare a moment to glance back to those past days of 1940, which are so strangely imprinted on our memories that we can hardly tell whether they are near or far away. In those days of May and June and July, in that terrible summer when we stood alone, and as the world thought forlorn against the all-powerful aggressor with his vast armies and masses of equipment, Antony Eden, as Secretary of State for War, called upon the local defense volunteers to rally round the searchlight positions. Shotguns, sporting rifles, clubs and staves were all they could find for weapons. It was not until July that we ferried safely across the Atlantic the million rifles and 1,000 field guns with ammunition proportionable, which were given to us by the government and people of the United States by an act of precious and timely succor. You will remember how we had the special trains waiting to carry the rifles to all the home guard areas and how you worked night and day to clean them from the grease in which they had been stored for a generation. You will remember how we hardly dared to fire a round for practice, so dire was the stringency. But this was the great turning point in your story. And I asked that your name should be changed and that you should assume the proud title of Home Guard. Thenceforward, at any rate, you had military weapons in your hands. Thenceforward, when imagining the horrors of a Han invasion, there rose that last consoling thought of unenslavable men you can always take one with you. 
very different is our condition today. We are an armed people. In strength of the home guard has risen steadily. Clothing and equipment are complete. Instead of the shotguns and homemade bombs, most now have rifles or Sten guns or machine guns or serve in the anti-tank or anti-aircraft teams. Ammunition, long so scarce, is now sufficient to allow each man to practice with his own weapons. We have just authorized a substantial increase for firing practice. Since 1940, many of the Home Guard have joined the regular forces. Some older men have retired, having done their duty in the hour of need. Younger men owe to them the experience and leadership they have inherited. Nearly a year ago, compulsory enrollment was introduced, and the directed men, as they are called, have proved as good and as willing as the original volunteers. With them came the lads of 17, many already trained in the Army Cadet Forces. New units have been formed for special duties. Many hundred of ACAC guns are manned by the Home Guard. Scores of batteries have been in action and have acquitted themselves worthily. Women have played an ever larger part at the guns. The coast defense and motor transport units which have been formed will grow in efficiency throughout the year. Credit is due not only to the Home Guardsmen themselves, but to all who have helped them, to the employers and managements who make it easy to fit in Home Guard duty with the men's employment, to the wives and mothers who have made Home Guard service easier in so many ways, and to the voluntary women helpers to whom we have now given in uh, official recognition uh, a badge of service. We have now nearly two million resolute, trained and equipped men, all of whom do their daily work in field or factory, and add to it free greatest and for nothing but honor, uh, the last and proudest duty of a citizen of the empire and a soldier of the king. People who note and mark our growing mastery of the air not only over our island, but penetrating into ever-widening zones on the continent, uh, asked whether the danger of invasion has not passed away. Let me assure you of this, uh, that until Hitler and Hitlerism are beaten into unconditional surrender, the danger of invasion will never pass away. The degree of the invasion danger depends entirely upon the strength or weakness of the forces and preparations gathered to meet it. Here is that sense of imminent emergency which cheers and inspires the long routine of drills and musters after a hard day's work is done. But I have more to say to you than this. I am speaking to you now from the White House in Washington, where I am staying with my honored friend, the President of the United States. These are great days. They are like the days in Lord Chatham's time, of which it was said you had to get up very early in the morning not to miss some news of victory. Ah, but victory is no conclusion. Even final victory will only open a new and happier field of valiant endeavor. The victories gained by the way must be a spur. We are gathered here now with the highest professional authorities in all the fighting services of the two great English-speaking nations to plan well ahead of the armies who are moving swiftly forward it is no good having only one march ahead laid out. March after march must be planned as far as human eye can see. Design and forethought must be our guides and heralds. We owe it to the fighting troops. We owe it to the vast communities we are leading out of the dark places. 
We owe it to heroic Russia, to long-tormented China. We owe it to the captive and enslaved nations who beckon us on through their prison bars. At present, we have strong armies in Great Britain, and it is the assembly base for the United States armies of liberation coming across the broad Atlantic. But this is not the end. We must prepare for the time which is approaching and will surely come when the bulk of these armies will have advanced across the seas into deadly grapple on the continent. <coughs> just, as in the sa just in the same way as the Home Guard render the regular forces mobile against an invader, so the Home Guard must now become capable of taking a great deal of the burden of home defense onto themselves and thus set free the bulk of our trained troops for the assault of the strongholds of the enemy's power. It is this reason which above all others has prompted me to make you and all Britain realize afresh by this Home Guard celebration and demonstration the magnitude and lively importance of your duties and of the part you have to play in the supreme cause now gathering momentum as it rolls forward to its goal. That is the end of the Prime Minister's broadcast. We return you now to New York.